we are going to look at nuisance in this lesson. And at the very outset, it must be noted that unlike the other topics that we have covered in the law of thought, nuisance relates to the enjoyment uh, or a non-interference with one's land or the claimant's land. So we will look at those nitty-gritties a bit later on in the lesson. But to begin with, as a definition, in a very simple context, nuisance is the unreasonable interference with the land of another, which may or may not cause damage, but in most cases is very intangible in nature. So there are a few elements that we must look at in order to determine if a nuisance has occurred, and if so, who can be held liable. First of all, there are two types of nuisance. You have private nuisance and public nuisance. Most syllabuses cover private nuisance in great detail, and as such, this particular lesson also will focus a lot on private nuisance. But as an outline, we will also look at public nuisance at the very end. The first element we are going to look at is what exactly constitutes an interference. Now, in order to determine what constitutes an interference, we have to have a look at the case law. So, for instance, in Christie and Davy, we see that noise has been considered an interference. Emotional distress also has been considered an interference, as in Thomas and Kostaki, as well as smell in Wheeler and J.J. Saunders. Flooding of water onto the claimant's land has been considered an interference in Sedley and O'Callaghan. But it must be noted, as held by Ray C.J., Chief Justice Ray, in Hunter and Canary Wharf, that interference cannot be things of delight. On the specific facts, which you will see in the case summaries, Hunter related to a blockage of a TV signal, and it was considered something of delight and not essential. But mind you, there is argument regarding this in a contemporary context because today we view television, the internet and so many other technological aspects as part of our lives and disruption of such technologies might constitute an interference today while it might not have been at the time Hunter was decided. We must also keep in mind that whatever interference might have occurred and wherever court has held that, yes, a nuisance has occurred, it must be practical to stop it from occurring as well. Most often than not, nuisances might occur due to activities of a public authority even. In such a case, it's unlikely due to public policy that a court would hold in favor of the claimant. But we will look at certain other areas in which there is room for argument a bit later on. Another crucial segment in determining whether a nuisance has occurred is unreasonableness. Now, this is a caution that has come up time and time again when we have discussed other topics in the law of thought as well. And as such, unreasonableness has to be determined after looking at several different areas. For instance, if the interference or if the purported nuisance has been there for some time or longer in nature, then it is likely to be unreasonable, as held in Crown, Watt and Kimbleton. Now here as well, you need to realize that the duration element depends on the actual interference being caused. Therefore, there might be an occasion where a few minutes might be considered too unreasonable and other occasions when a couple of years or even decades might be unreasonable. But on the other hand, on this latter context, it must be noted that if it has in fact been happening for several years or even decades, it might have actually become part of the environment itself and it will be difficult for the claimant to claim that it is a nuisance if it has been tolerated, let's say, for such a long time. Now this provides a good insight into our next element when discussing unreasonableness, which is locality. In Gilliam, Borough Council and Medway, it was held that if the character of the neighborhood has changed, then the defendant will not be liable. What this signifies is, if for instance, the claimant is in a residential area and there is a sudden inflow of factories which may result in excessive noise or fumes, that might be held as an opportunity for court to hold that 
this is a residential area and there is one factory that has come in therefore there is a nuisance however if the locality is now being transformed into not a residential but a commercial area then it will be unfair for court to hold that it has to have the significant features of a residential area now in Sturgis and Bridgman it's in your case summaries have a look at it it was held that the decision of unreasonableness based on locality must be decided upon a ratio of the claimants and the defendants. Now, this is an exciting way of looking at locality. What was actually stated was, how many claimants per defendants are there? So, we must consider in that regard, as in Sturgis and Bridgman, whether it will be fair to determine for the benefit of one or two people to change whatever is occurring so it's pretty much based on a ratio. Another quite straightforward way of determining unreasonableness is sensitivity. Now this is a very qualitative aspect of unreasonableness, yet in Robinson and Kilwert, sensitivity is elucidated really well by the court. And they state that if the claimant is abnormally sensitive, then the defendant will not be liable. But if the ordinary enjoyment is affected, then the defendant will be liable as held in McKinnon and Walker. Sensitivity itself is not sufficient to determine unreasonableness, but failing all other areas, this is one aspect that the court will definitely look at. We must also consider whether the defendant had been acting with malice. More often than not, if there is a component of malice involved, court will side with the claimant. The best way in order to determine whether something is unreasonable was elucidated in Cambridge Water and Eastern Counties Leather, where it was stated that if land is used unreasonably and the damage itself is reasonably foreseeable, then the defendant should be held liable. Now, of course, Cambridge Water falls under the category of Rylands, which we will look at later, but it's important to have a look at it now itself in the case summaries for a better understanding. Unlike other areas of tort, nuisance requires a more stringent set of guidelines or filters in order to sustain a claim. Now, one of the main elements that is required for a person who can sue is that he or she must be the owner of land, as in Hunter and Canary Wharf. However, there are exceptions to this rule, as seen in Korosanjian and Bush, McKenna and British Aluminium. Both these cases were in reference to a policy initiative in order to provide a remedy for the claimants who would not otherwise have a remedy. So it's likely that you can argue that a claim in nuisance can only be sustained when all other options are unavailable to a claimant. Having said that, we must also now look at who can be sued in relation to a tort of nuisance. For instance, one of the most clear-cut examples is since nuisance deals with land itself and the only people who can sue are the owners of land, the obvious conclusion is that owners themselves of land can be sued. For instance, a neighboring property holder. The occupier of a land also can be sued. It might be someone who is currently residing or, as in Johns and Portsmouth County Council, a person who is the controller of the hazard or even the creator of the hazard. As such, there are many people who can be sued, but in correlation to the land itself. Finally, in relation to private nuisance, we're going to look at what defenses are available in relation to a claim. Now, I mentioned earlier that in relation to unreasonableness, the duration might play a pivotal role in arguing that there was no nuisance that took place. As such, there is a defense of coming into the nuisance, which means if whatever is being purported as a nuisance has been occurring for several years or even decades, it might indicate that it cannot be constituted as a nuisance itself and that whoever party is claiming might have just simply come into a situation without knowing about it. Another is prescription, as in Sturgis and Bridgman. By denoting that the defendants have been in the vicinity or have been in the business of maybe factory work or manufacturing for such a long time, that they have now prescribed to the land that they have been using and that whoever is claiming has actually tried to shift the paradigm of the premises. Statutory authority is another good example of a defense which is afforded for public authorities on public policy basis. And finally, you have alternate dispute resolution, as in Markic and Thames. 
where rather than the normal procedure of court, there might have been other mechanisms prescribed in order to follow in case of a claim for nuisance. Before we move on to the next topic, we'll briefly look at what public nuisance is. And I suppose the best example can be seen in AG and PYE quarries, where public nuisance was defined as any nuisance which materially affects reasonable comfort of a class of Her Majesty's subjects. In essence, what it means is, whereas private nuisance refers to affecting the enjoyment of one person or maybe few people in one particular location, public nuisance refers to multiplications of that. But when it is granted, it's in relation to a massive outcry from a substantial group of people, as in this case referred to as a class of Her Majesty's subjects. That was nuisance. Next, we will look at Rylands and Fletcher, which is an extension of nuisance. <laughs>